Hi, good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming out. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to talk about engineering for the future. I do not have all the answers, just to put that straight out there. But I think there's a few sort of things we need to kind of think about as we move forward. Um, just by way of introduction, I am a structural engineer by training. Um, I studied at the University of Bath originally, and I started my career at Bura Happold in Bath also. Um, worked on the Millennium Dome project on site, that was fun. I did a master's in earthquake engineering and dynamics because I like kind of things that shook around. And um, I got chartered with the ICE in 2000. <laughs> Sorry. And um, having done earthquake engineering, I was quite keen to do it to be somewhere that had earthquakes. So in uh, 2002, I moved to San Francisco, good place for earthquakes, so with Arup. And so I was doing a lot of performance-based engineering, seismic engineering, and I worked on the California Academy of Sciences, as you see there, it's in Golden Gate Park, by Renzo Piano, that's a great building if you get a chance to visit. And then in 2007, I left Arup to join a very small, woman-owned engineering firm called um, Hinman Consulting Engineers, led by Eve Hinman, and they specialized in blast engineering. So again, dynamics, blast, earthquakes. Uh, so I did that, um, and I left the US um, I got my PE in California, so I'm qualified over there, and I'm also a US citizen, I don't share that very often, um, but it's quite useful, it might be quite useful, uh, depends how it goes over here, <laughs> not going too well over there either. Um, so, and then I came back in um, 2013, and I rejoined Bureau Happold to lead their actual blast engineering um, team. And um, I've been doing quite a lot of work in counterterrorism, which is very much, I think, a multidisciplinary thing, it's not just structural hardening, it's actually thinking about all the, how all the disciplines come together to actually protect buildings. So I've been thinking about resilience and what that was, and I was thinking, Bureau Happel, multidisciplinary, be an interesting opportunity to maybe think about resilience consulting as a service, pulling together all of these disciplines, kind of like sort of sustainability consulting. So I kind of pitched that idea when I, I got back, and they said, sure, that sounds like an interesting proposition, off you go. So. Um, I spent the last few years thinking about, um, well, developing tools for measuring resilience and kind of, um, I'm going to share some of those with you today. And I've been sort of focusing on cities, but it's very applicable at any, any level. Um, so let's get moving. So my question I'd pose for you really is, are we fit for the future? Is the way that we're engineering currently um, going to satisfy our clients in 50 years' time? Are the buildings we're designing, is the infrastructure we're designing actually fit? Um, the US military has dubbed this a VUCA environment, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And that was before this guy even um, appeared. So there's lots of kind of issues, and I'm going to talk about a few of them and maybe how they uh, affect us and what we need to sort of be thinking about. So the uh, geopolitics. These guys have caused quite a bit of trouble recently. Um, so obviously, you know, Brexit, thinking about how that's going to affect us in terms of the engineering industry and how that's going to affect our clients. And so it's very, very uncertain at the moment. And it could be an issue in terms of skills, skills coming to the UK. It could be an issue in terms of um, our economy. And it really does sort of rely on good governance to actually pull us through. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, and obviously on the other side, my contingency plan to go back to America is not doing too well either. Um, so um, quite interestingly, you've got, you can see Qatar in the background there, and I'm sure a lot of us have been working on projects for the 2022 Olympics. I've no idea whether that's even still happening. So, you know, these kind of current affairs, we're all linked together with sort of globalization, so we kind of need to be aware of all these factors and how they affect what we're doing. It might seem that, okay, we're just designing this building, but actually, we, you know, we need to be really aware of how all these things will affect us and our clients. Urbanization. So um, this is an interesting one. By about 2050, 70% of the population will live in cities. Um, so in terms of us as engineers, cities are going to be really sort of primary hotspots for, for design and thinking about how we uh, manage that increased population. And a lot of these cities are actually in locations which are quite vulnerable. So you think about just the US, you've got 40% of the US living on the coast. So you've got you know, earthquakes on the west coast and you've got hurricanes on the, on the east coast. So a lot of, um, and, the, and those sort of, certainly the hurricanes are getting worse due to things like climate change, you've got sea level rise, 
Um, and certainly California has got a few few issues by 2050 in terms of its, you know, it's, I think it's got a ninth largest GDP and, and it's producing a lot of fruit, wine, but actually it's going to get hotter and hotter and a lot of those things that it's doing are going to move north into Washington State. So Washington State is going to be doing quite well, but I'm not sure about California. So, you know, the, thinking about um, these effects and certainly um, designing of cities, if you think about traditionally, we've designed cities based around the motor car. So how, you know, how, you know we haven't really thought that much about people. And there's a really good um, film by a Gell Architects called Human Scale, which I would encourage you to watch, which is about how we rethink designing cities for people as opposed to vehicles, which is like, oh, that's an interesting concept. Um, so I think we need to think about that as we move forward in terms of our city spaces, how, are, you know, how do we design for those? And then demographics is actually an interesting one because if you think about the UK, we're an ageing population now. There's going to be more people um, not in the workforce than in the workforce. So that has an effect on our economy. It has an effect on how we design. If we're designing for a more aged population, how is that going to affect us? It also affects us in terms of our immigration policy. Are we bringing people in to actually fill that fill that workforce or not. Um, so, and then also thinking about where we get our work from. So um, places like Africa, India, and the Middle East are a young work workforce. So in the next sort of 10, 20, 30, they're going to be, you know, going to have a lot of cheap labor. And so how is that going to affect us and uh, as we move forward? Climate change. So obviously, you're obviously all aware of this. Um, See, Trump's not aware of it, but um, I think we can all agree that things are happening. So heat stress, water stress, sea level rise, air pollution, all these things are affecting us and affect our projects, affect our clients. So obviously we need to be cognizant of how that affects our design. And just sort of taking water stress and looking at um, these are the hotspots predicted for, I think, 2045. And you can see a little dot in the UK there. So the UK is not going to be unaffected by this. So apparently... Um, I think the southeast has less rainfall per capita than somewhere like Sudan. That's a fact now. And you, you wouldn't think that, but it does. And so how is that going to affect us in terms of... Um, so we're going to be sort of predicting warmer, wetter winters, drier, hotter summers. So that's going to have an effect on some of the design assumptions for our buildings in terms of soil, soil properties are going to change. Um, temperatures inside buildings. So we really sort of kind of need to think about this and also the frequency of events, storms, etc. Talking of which, flooding. So Thames Valley 2014, we saw Cumbria a couple of years ago. So traditionally we designed for events, so like a one in 100 year event. We're seeing one in 100 year events every six years in Cumbria, for example. What does that mean for our design? Should we therefore be designing for things bigger, better, or should we actually have a bit of a different strategy? Should our expectation for these more frequent events be different, or should we have a different design approach and think about, well, actually, maybe we can tolerate some exceedance provided we manage the failure? So just sort of thinking about how is this affecting us now? Do we... Is the code approach we have right now fit for that, or do we need to go to a bit more sort of risk, risk performance-based type of approach? Technology is an interesting one, because I think there's, a huge, there's huge opportunities here. There are risks here, but there are also opportunities. So thinking about um, you know, automation, 3D printing, AI, and other things such as uh, you know, modularization, um, new materials and think about how we can kind of, you know, in incorporating smart technology into our buildings. So there's all these things that provide, provide great opportunity. And, you know, currently we're obviously building information modelling is pretty much where we are right now and that's getting more and more information. But we're sort of moving towards, you know, 3D printing. Are we going to be 3D printing buildings? You know, this is, this is pretty impressive. And this really kind of frees up architecture and thinking about form and making something very different. So how do we engineer for this? Or is the technology going to be engineering for us? Because something like this, I know the UC, uh, UCL Bartlett School are looking at generative modelling. So they're kind of modelling these organic forms, but putting kind of para parameters around them, sort of saying, OK, we want this to be resilient, we want this to do this. And, and so I think that's the sort of way the design is going to be going in terms of this sort of parametric, sort of organic design. So this, that's going to change how we, how we work. 
automation and AI. So we're all going to be out of jobs soon. So um, same friend at UCL was telling me that one of his colleagues has developed, um, so he's obviously been experimenting with AI quite at a small scale, but they have AI that actually can take an architectural design and say whether it thinks it's going to stand up. It's not doing that by doing computation, it's doing that because it's learned what type of structures stand up. You're like, oh, that's kind of interesting. Isn't that what we do? Because we kind of get that feel and that sense for, oh yeah, that will stand up, that looks about right. But they're learning to do that too. So we need to think about how do we utilise that, but how does that change the skill set that we need as engineers? Because we're going to have these computers that can actually do quite a lot of the number crunching and, uh, for us. And then this raises the issue of security because everything's smart in tech, so we really need to think about making ourselves secure and protecting ourselves from um, these security and data breaches. So, all of these issues, oh no, what are we going to do? Well, um, that's, to me, this is all about resilience, and I'm going to define that for you. It's on, you can see. Um, because I think resilience means different things to different people. I think tradi traditionally it's meant... Um, rebounding quickly from some kind of disruption but actually our sort of current definition is a lot broader and so it's thinking about that will and ability to do something before the event and if something happens to be able to adapt and respond and and change and um, thrive actually to so be more prepared and it's about disruption but it's also about change so it's about both of those things and we, and the approach that we've been um, working on, it certainly looks at, it's a risk-based approach, and it looks at shocks and stresses, it looks at um, physical assets, it looks at social governance, and all those pieces together. It's not just, it's very comprehensive, and I think that's how we should be treating resilience. It's not just resilience of one thing. I think lots of people tend to put the word resilience after a single discipline, and I'm thinking, well... Is that really resilient if it's just one part, if it's just structural resilience or it's just geotechnical resilience? It's like, well, how is your building resilient? How is your city resilient? How is your country resilient? So what is our role, what are our, is our role as, an, as engineers um, in this? And so I think traditionally it's been, well, this is what I would say, I guess, uh, protect, protecting people and assets through reducing vulnerability. And as an earthquake engineer and blast engineer, I feel that that's, that's what I do. Um, but I think we can actually think a little bit bigger. I think we need to start thinking about our role to actually not just sort of do as the client asks, but actually to start informing the client, actually, these are the things you should be worried about. This is, if you think of it from a risk standpoint, actually, you know, we should be advising them what they should be designing. We should be advising on the policy to do that. And so really kind of, you know, as engineers, as a collective, I think we have our answers to a lot of these issues. So, these are the opportunities that I see, and I'm going to talk about those um, in more detail. And I'm going to talk about these concepts, but I'm also going to sort of interweave a project I've been working on, which is actually a comprehensive resilience plan for the city of Beirut. Not just, you know, just to start with an easy one. Um, and I'll talk about, you know, it's, it's quite big conceptually, but you can apply it at any scale, so hopefully um, um, it'll make sense in terms of the concepts I'm talking about. So I'll just sort of go over, we have a four stage um, approach and this is obviously applying to cities but you can think about applying it to a, a potentially a building or, or, or a master plan. Um, for something that's existing or even new, uh, we have this diagnostic where, and it's really about setting that vision and objectives to begin with and really understanding the value that the city or the building or the organisation is delivering. And there's a whole process around sort of data collection and stakeholder engagement and a piece around sort of risk in terms of identifying the shocks and the stresses sorry, that um, the city, the organisation, the building is going to be under and be able to understand that and prioritise those and then look at the, if it's existing, you're looking at the existing vulnerabilities within that city um, and then prioritising where action needs to be taken. So it's kind of saying, it's that step above, so you're actually saying, these are all the issues, let's look at this logically, okay, this is where we need to build resilience. And that might not just be sort of physical, it's also things like governance, it's things like communities, and I'll talk a bit more about that 
So the second phase is really that strategy development. So this is what we're more familiar with, coming up with solutions to these problems we've identified. Um, and looking at then the cost benefit of those, because we really need to be a bit more plugged into understanding that financial and, and angle so that we can get investment to build resilience. And then there's a piece around capacity of building in terms of implementing. And then there's thriving, flourishing, and you know, starting again, because you, it's a continuous kind of loop in terms of understanding resilience and um, checking your, your shocks and stresses. OK, Beirut. Uh, it's actually a very, very nice city. I've been there about five times now. And I was a bit scared at first because you grew up in the 70s, 80s, and it was a bit you know, volatile over there. And they've been through, they've been through a hell of a lot. I mean, it's, a, it's, an, it's actually a really old city. It's about 5,000 years old. A lot of heritage, uh, but obviously a lot of disruption over the last, certainly over the last century, particularly in terms of civil war. Um, and um, so their infrastructure is in a bit of a mess. Um, it's, it's uh, well, the first thing I noticed actually when I got there was the air quality. The air quality is terrible. And uh, a lot of that is because they have no mass transit system. They have old vehicles. But they also have generators because they don't actually have 24-hour electricity. And they're used to that. And so they've gone and they're quite resilient people. They've gone and got their own generators. Um, but that's obviously contributing to an air quality problem, which is was then contributing to a health problem. And so there are you know, lots of things going on. Um, and then they have an earthquake problem as well. So they actually uh, realized recently that one of the local faults is actually way worse than they thought it was. And so uh, they now have, I think it's equivalent to a 2B, Old, U, old, uh, old sort of money, um, UBC uh, rating. So they actually need to be um, designing buildings duct for duct ductility, which they haven't been. And they only had a, uh, an earthquake code in 2012, I think. And most of the buildings in the city are pre-1980. So, you know, they've got all of these layered problems, and it's like, where do they even start? Um, so we were looking at that. So one of the first things you need to do and need to think about is, you know, think about outcomes, think about values. What, what, is, what is this entity delivering? So as a city, what do they actually want? What's, what's the thing they're, they're actually there for? So obviously they're there for, you know, prosperity. They're, they're interested in protecting their heritage. They want quality of life for their citizens. They want stability. They want to be inclusive as a city. So we kind of workshopped with them and uh, stakeholders in the city about what it was that, you know, made Beirut, Beirut. What do they value? What do they want to be? And so I think starting there is really good no matter what, what you're looking at, whether you're looking at a city, whether you're looking at an organisation or even you know, a building. It's what is this building's purpose? What is the value it's delivering? And how do I protect that? Because resilience is about protecting value. And then we looked at, well, what's delivering that value to the city? How do we ha So it's looking at that complexity of all the pieces that make up a city. And so this is the framework that we developed at Bureau Happold. Um, and so the, the orange is essentially um, about leadership and governance. And so all those pieces, uh, skills, education, business, trade, security, safety. The blue is really sort of infrastructure. So looking at systems, technology, resources, environment, and then your structures and infrastructure. And then the sort of greeny color is um, sort of community, community and inclusion. So thinking about those social aspects, health and well-being, mobility, uh, and culture and heritage. So there's all these pieces, and we call those value chains because they're adding to the value of the city, but they're also vulnerabilities that we need to protect, and they interact with each other, and we need to understand that. So we developed a framework that, that measures that, and I'll show you that in more detail. But first, there's a piece around um, shocks and stresses. So as engineers, or as structural engineers, we're used to, have, used to designing for shocks, so that would be flooding, earthquakes... Uh, terrorist incidents, fires, impact potentially, but we don't really think so much about stresses. And stresses are those things that kind of um, run along sort of day to day, and it could be those big things like climate change, but it could be things like you know congestion or inequality. Um, there's other things I talk about urbanisation, and I think it's important to consider those because those change things over time, and some of those will become shocks themselves. And some of them will just exacerbate the existing, existing situation. And I'll give you an example. So like in New York, I think it was in the late 90s, they, um, they had a blackout. And what followed that was a riot because of um, the community instability and community lack of cohesion. 
that, you know, that was a chain of events. So that kind of stress of the community in cohesion, if you like, um, caused that shock to be worse, the outcome to be worse. And so understanding those sort of interactions is important. And I think they did a lot of work in terms of building community kind of um, sort of awareness and, and cohesion over about 10 years. And the next time they actually had a blackout, they didn't have any of those problems. And I used to live in San Francisco and across the bay is Oakland. And basically every time anything happens, there's a, there's a riot because the community is just not, not, not cohesive. So it's very important that we think about that. And if we're designing a building or a city, we're thinking about how is this design parameter going to change over time and how do I incorporate that into that design? What do I need to be thinking about? So it might be something like you know, geotechnical conditions if the, with a change in climate. It might be sea level rise if you're quite near the coast. Or, so it's just thinking about being mindful and, OK, these are things that I might not know the answer to. There's a level of uncertainty here. And so we want, might want to just think about that, you know, um, how our assumptions um, are sensitive to those. So these are actually um, the shocks for Beirut. So we did a, an analysis of looking at, so we had a, like a list of about 150 different shocks and stresses in our model. And this is kind of came out of the top 10 or so. And so you're looking at impact versus probability. And so you've got those sort of um, very frequent, almost yearly events to the bottom right, but you've got those less frequent, but very uh, the high consequence events to the top left. So you've got things like earthquakes that I mentioned, but then also they have a tsunami risk because they're right next to the coast. Armed conflict, there's still an issue for them. Uh, but things like pandemics, uh, infrastructure failure because their infrastructure is not very reliable, um, terrorism, cyber attacks, winter storms, epidemics. So we're looking at full spectrum because it's a city. Um, but adding to that, we have the stresses that I mentioned earlier as well. So we have environmental stresses, we have climate change. Water stress is a huge problem for Beirut. Uh, because they get all of their water from ice melt. So changing climate is going to affect that. Um, and it's already the groundwater levels are um, pretty low because they've been putting in wells because they don't have a reliable water supply. So they've been drawing on their aquifer uh, for some time and they have now have saltwater intrusion into that aquifer. So add to that climate change, add to that potential for an earthquake, and they've got a really, you know, um, not good situation. I mentioned air quality earlier. Air quality is definitely a problem affecting health. Um, and then urban development. They have, don't really have an urban development plan. And uh, I'll say this, um, the, the de local developers are very, have a very um, strong influence in the area. And the, certainly the last two mayors have been very closely linked to the develop development that's going on in the area. So it's, it's not particularly constrained. Um, they've done some nice work in some areas, but I think they need to be a bit more kind of um, controlled in terms of how they do it and think a bit more about the risks they have. So the seismic risk, for example, there's no restriction on building on liquefiable soil and they've reclaimed a lot of sand, a lot of um, land down by the uh, coast. Health, I mentioned. Um, socioeconomics, definitely an issue. A lot of poverty. And they've actually had, uh, because of the Syria crisis, they've had a huge number of Syrians come in. And because Beirut's the main kind of uh, city in Lebanon, I think they basically increased the population of Beirut by 50%. And you imagine adding that many people just on top of already a really struggling infrastructure. They've got, you know, it's, it's a huge issue. And we were asked, well, what can we do about that? And it's actually, I was quite... Um, that's a really big problem, but obviously increasing resilience in all of these areas does help, but you know, it's, it's definitely a huge problem. And then governance, actually, this is really interesting to me because I'm not an ex expert at governance, but kind of learning about, um, essentially, um, Lebanon is a confessional system, so it's all based on religion, and so certain posts are held by certain religious affiliations, right? And so that doesn't actually, it's not very effective in terms of governance. Um, and then Beirut is quite interesting because it has a mayor, but it's also a governorate. So it has a governor, and, they, and so they, they have roles, but it's sort of the interaction is quite um, interesting. And so 
they don't really have much of a governance structure. They aren't doing things like risk assessments. They don't have a good understanding of what they're at risk from. They don't really have a plan for what to do. So actually, that's where you need to start because you can't get anything done until the way that they govern actually works. And so we did quite a bit of work around kind of establishing a kind of framework for, OK, you need to put a, you know, a committee together of these types of people and you need to actually you know, start, start gathering data, start understanding your risk and then start doing some of these programmes that we were suggesting. So, um, back to resilience. Uh, resilience demand. So, we have a risk-based process. So, you can see on the left those shocks and stresses I was think, talking about. And then in the middle you have your system, whether it's a city, a building, or an organisation. And so your, your, your city here is a system, and you've got that framework I was showing you earlier. And we think of those as they are vulnerabilities, and we have those um, environmental stresses, but we also have those structural stresses. I call them structural because it's sort, of, it's sort of integral to the city. And then that combination gives you an impact in terms of if something happens... It's all in, they're all interdependent, and so then you have an impact in terms of an impact on people, an impact on the society, an impact on reputation, you know, environment, infrastructure. And so it's kind of measuring that impact. And so that's what we call resilience demand. It's a risk-based um, quantification. So that's one side. And on the other side, we look at capacity as engineers. Capacity, demand, capacity. That's why I did it that way. Um, and... Obviously, we'll, I'll start with mitigation because as engineers, we're very much familiar with the term mitigation because we're trying to um, protect something and stop it happening before it happens. And so we have a number of metrics that we measure. So not just thinking about robustness, not just thinking about structurally engineering something to be robust. There are other tactics here. So um, we have five here. So health is more about the health of that, if it's an existing structure, and the maintenance. So how well is it maintained? What sort of condition is it in? Protection is about off-site protection. So think about something like the Thames Barrier is an off-site protection. So if you had a site in London, that's already protecting you. So that's actually reduced your risk there. Robustness is you know, that strength for that specific flood or whatever it happens to be. And then diversification or redundancy is another strategy. So a lot of you know, the critical infrastructure, the um, electricity, the, the, the um, tactic is... Um, redundancy, and, and same with data centres. And then the last one is really like fail safe. So it's thinking about, well, okay, well, if, if something does, bad does happen, let me make sure that doesn't cascade. Let's make sure we don't have Fukushima. Let's kind of stop it at the earthquake and the, and the tsunami. Let's not have that nuclear reactor meltdown. So it's kind of understanding that potential chain of failure and making sure that doesn't happen. And I'm going to talk a bit more about that in a second. The other side is what we call adaptive capacity, and it's really tying together that design with the operation. So it's understanding what capacity we have and then having that contingency still because you're still going to need to prepare and respond, recover, and learn from that event when it happens. And so we need to tie those things together because they're not really currently tied together. And so adaptive capacity is quite interesting because it's about... It's, in some ways, it's slightly intangible because it's about that agility and that adaptability and what are the qualities of that. It's about really understanding your environment and understanding how to make decisions quickly and then respond quickly. And, and so, in some ways, we're quite good at that, actually. We've put quite a lot of effort into the response side, of, especially in the UK. Um, actually, most cities actually tend to focus too much on the response and not really on the trying to prevent it in the first place because they perceive that as costing money. So it's kind of up to us in some ways to be able to articulate the business case for investing in um, building that resilience capacity before these events happen. And I think we can, and I'll show you how we, how we do that. So I'm just going to sort of go off onto fail-safe design for a second, because essentially, being an earthquake engineer and a blast engineer, I've been doing performance-based engineering basically for the, next, for the last 15 or so years. So I haven't opened a code for quite a while. <laughs> so, and... I think we can learn a lot from this because I think this is sort of the way we need to move in the future because we really need to be thinking about risk and performance and having that conversation with our clients. And so I have this conversation quite often because, you know, code doesn't tell you how to protect a building from blast. And so the question is, are you at risk from this? And what sort of damage can you tolerate if this happens? Can you, you know, what sort of downtime? What do you want to pay to repair it? And so... I think that's the kind of, you know, thinking in those terms is the way we sort of need to think now as, as engineers. And because, you know, code-based design right now, you know, it's life-safe design. If, 
And in, in, if I'm designing for an earthquake, I can choose life safety, and that, but often the client thinks that I've designed it then for an earthquake. Oh, no, 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 I've designed it not to fall down. It's going to be really damaged. Do they understand that? You can design for immediate occupancy, which means it's very small damage, repairable, and they'll be able to be up and running pretty quickly. And so there's different levels, and I think we need to be articulating that to our clients and really understanding what they want um, from their design, from their building, from their cities. So back to Beirut, and we can look at... Um, so we looked at um, resilience demand in blue and resilience capacity in green for the different shocks. And so we could say, well, OK, where are our biggest gaps then? And we did that by t doing the calculation I showed you earlier. So we looked at the resilient demands from all those shocks and stresses on the city. We looked at the capacity that it currently had to withstand those. And then we're looking at where the gaps are. So we're looking at earthquakes was actually our biggest gap. No, that wasn't a huge surprise. Um, Obviously, you could use this for a new building, too. You could say, well, these are your demands. Where do you actually want to be in terms of performance? Because you don't necessarily want to be you know, 100%, because you, don't know, you might not be able to afford to be, for example. Um, so th this was how we sort of ranked those. But it was, it's not just about the shocks. It's about these other areas in, in terms of the vulnerabilities of the city. And this is our framework that we developed at Bureau Happel. And you'll notice that the Bureau Happel branding is on this, because they very kindly let me still show these. Um, so the blue is your resilience demand, and then your green is your resilience capacity. And the 51 is your capacity over demand. So it's just one over the other. So 100 would have been you met all of your demands. And so this kind of shows different areas, so community, governance. What's interesting about this shape is it's quite uniform, which generally means we've come to learn that your governance is a problem because you're uniformly pretty bad. <laughs> so it's quite useful from that aspect. Um, and actually, in terms of um, things we identified, uh, the items on the left were all kind of issues that we you know, then went on to develop um, plans for. So this cross-sectoral kind of committee was one of the first things, having more transparency and accountability, uh, risk governance were kind of all the sort of governance pieces. <laughs> there were societal pieces around um, sort of mobility, community spaces, equality, and then there were obviously the more kind of environmental infrastructure. So there's a whole piece we did a, um, a plan around um, climate change adaptation, um, looking at um, reducing existing risks uh, due to earthquakes. And then there's a whole sort of um, waste management um, was a huge issue actually. I didn't show you a picture of that, but they had waste on their streets um, during floods like two years ago. Um, so they have, they have some definite infrastructure problems. So just to show you in context of other cities, we've looked at other cities in terms of so this, is, this looks quite similar, but bigger, bigger shocks. This is a kind of a mega city, Sao Paulo. And again, that's a governance issue as well. Then you have things like Bristol, where I live at the moment, and that looks very different. And definitely you get spikes in terms of that community area. And then um, London, which again looks quite different, and that's also, okay, well, there's a huge, there's a huge gap here in community resilience. Um, so it kind of it's, it's quite a, just a sort of snapshot. Obviously, it's much more complicated. And certainly on on Beirut, we actually ended up mapping the demand geospatially for the city and really trying to highlight. But it actually comes down to data. And someone like Beirut does not have a huge amount of data, but a lot of the cities in this country uh, does. So it's a, bit, a little bit easier. So then. I touched on this earlier, I think what's really important is that we're able to articulate this business case and really understanding the economics and how to talk, how to, how to really kind of get that investment and really help with that piece. And so a number of things we looked at, uh, this is just one example. So on the right are all of the programs that we had kind of recommended. And then we looked at, well, okay, um, what does this save me in terms of loss of annual loss of life? What does this save me in terms of kind of economic loss due to these things not happening? And then this is an interesting one. There's a potential increase in productivity to that city by implementing some of these things. So if you think about it, if you've got an infrastructure program, then that's bringing jobs in, that's actually generating income or value to the city, and you can kind of measure that per, uh, per uh, GDP per capita. So we kind of try to put numbers around. We work with our economics team at Bureau Happel to kind of put some numbers to this, and I'm actually continuing conversations with sort of bankers and investors in terms of how do we actually start translating our engineering kind of pieces into something that somebody's going to want to invest in. Right, so let's try and sort of sum some of these things up. So 
what's really important in all of this is really this piece around integration because we can't be resilient as a single discipline. We have to kind of be integrated. It's joining those dots together. And that's one of the biggest challenges, certainly if you think about city level, everything just operates in silos and, and life just operates in silos. And so it's trying to break down some of those barriers and kind of pull it all together. And so this is just, you know, just thinking about from a building context, what are all the pieces that, that make a building resilient? And these are pro probably aren't even all of them, but... And then, in, in, you know, and then a, a building isn't just resilient in isolation. You know, you've got to think about its context and its community. You know, if, if there's a bridge that, you know, gets washed away. And, I mean, I've seen that. I think there was a, a really, in the States, there was a, a data center that's a resilient data center had a massive flood. So it was like nobody could get into the building. The building was fine, but like, nobody can get in. And so it's like, well, that's not very resilient, is it? So you've really got to sort of think about all of these components. Taking the lead as engineers, you know, let's tell them, you know, let's think about policy, let's think about influencing it, let's think about what do we need to do? We have all the solutions to this, don't we? Let's, uh, let's start kind of really, really pushing that forward. Embracing that technology. It's a little bit scary, but we need to kind of acknowledge this is changing, not just stick our head in the sand and say, okay, what does this mean for us? How do we need to change as engineers and as a profession? How do we need to move forward? How do we need to train the next generation coming up? Because it's going to be different to how we were trained. Well, that's certainly how I was trained. Which brings me on to education. I think this is the last slide. So thinking about what do we need to be teaching our engineers of the future? So I think there's a whole piece around understanding policy, understanding leadership and management. We need to be, have those skills. I think a risk-based approach, understanding risk and uncertainty, because that's what our future holds at the moment. Embracing those technologies, but understanding these computational advances, but actually you know, understanding how they interface with us as engineers. And there's a whole piece around being a consultant, being able to talk to our clients, understand what they need, being able to advise them, being that trusted advisor, and being a collaborator, bringing those stakeholders together that need to kind of help make those take those decisions um, and move things forward. And then thinking about these other strategies for resilience, thinking about you know, it's not just sort of deterministic in terms of, you know, here's a load, this is how I'm going to design, here's a load. No, we don't really know. How do we incorporate that uncertainty into our, the way that we design? And picking up some of those kind of concepts I talked about earlier. And I think it's important that we focus, always think about outcome and value, because that is ultimately what you're protecting, and that's what we're doing things for. So who is, you know... What is the value this building is offering? What is the value this city is bringing? And how are we, you know, what, what's our role? And I think if you, if you come at it from that way, it keeps you, it keeps that golden thread from top to bottom so you're really understanding why you're doing something and you're making sure that you, you know, that outcome, you're always thinking about that in terms of why you're doing certain designs. And I think it's important that we definitely pick up on the social scientists because the way that, I mean, it's been really interesting to me as an engineer thinking about, well, how do people kind of, you know, it's quite intangible trying to figure out how people behave and how that interacts with a city and, or a building or, you know, it's, it's, it's really important. And this includes obviously politics as well uh, and economics. And lastly, just being able to communicate, communicate and, and, and market ourselves and really kind of, um, so I think these are all skills that we really need to be kind of instilling in our engineers of the future as well as, you know, it's kind of a given that technically you can do, you know, number crunch, but you kind of need to have all these things too. Thank you.